Welcome, everybody, to our seminar here in CFT. Today, we have uh, John Selby. John Selby is now in the University of Gdansk. So John, he did, John, he did his PhD in the Imperial College of London in 2017. And after that, he did a postdoc in the Perimeter Institute for, for two years in Waterloo, Canada. And uh, since then, he is a postdoc in the ICTQT there in Gdansk. So today, John is going to talk about uh, contextuality without incompatibility. Thank you very much, John, for joining us and accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. Thanks, thanks. Um, so let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk. Um, it's really nice to, uh, to be here. This is my first presentation and first sort of, well, entrance back into academic life after paternity leave. So um, I'm quite tired and, well, hopefully this goes okay. We'll see. So this uh, main result that I'm going to present today was done in collaboration with, with this bunch of authors that you can see on the left here. And uh, the headline result is in this paper um, that's in bold on the right, uh, but it's sort of informed by the, the other two archive links I've given here. And also I'll briefly touch on a couple of other papers um, which were done in collaboration with uh, these people as well. So those are the, the archive references if you want to learn more. I'll put those up again at the end, though, so don't worry about writing them down now. OK, so this work is about the relationship between contextuality and incompatibility. And more broadly, really, about uh, the relationship between incompatibility and notions of non-classicality. Because I think that incompatibility of quantum theory is often considered to be A or even the key divergence of the quantum and the classical worlds. And there are many good ways, uh, many good reasons to, to think that this should be the case. Um, in particular, incompatibility is necessary for witnessing uh, Bellman classicality in the sense of uh, violations of Bellman inequalities. You need to have a set of incompatible measurements on each wing in order to uh, be able to violate a Bellman inequality. Um, Incompatibility really is central to the entire definition of Cock and Specker type contextuality. Um, you, you can't have any context at all there without incompatibility. So it's um, yeah, just definitionally necessary for that. And there was a quite a recent paper um, which showed that it's also necessary for a notion of non-classicality, uh, which can be called operational or contextuality. So these are all good reasons to believe that incompatibility and non-classicality are really uh, intimately linked with one another. But I'm going to try and argue in this talk that incompatibility really is not uh, that closely tied to uh, non-classicality in the end. So is it the essence of non-classicality? I'm going to try and persuade you the answer is no, despite these reasons that you might have uh, believed that it was. Um, so in one direction, it's been known for a while that incompatibility is, uh, uh, sorry, that non-classicality is not a necessity uh, for having incompatibility in your theory. Um, that there's this toy theory uh, constructed by Rob Speckens, um, which to my mind can reasonably be viewed as a classical uh, theory. And despite being classical, it features incompatible measurements. Um, that's been known for a while though, so I don't really want to get hung up on this. If you want to disagree with this, we can talk about this more at the end. And um, Other people might argue that this is not reasonably viewed as classical. It's a bit of a subjective matter in a sense. Uh, what this talk about is the sort of opposite direction. I want to argue that uh, there's a good notion of non-classicality, which is generalized non-contextuality. Um, you can have contextuality, i.e. non-classical, and that's what this talk is going to be about. Okay, so um, the outline of the talk is as follows. Uh, there's uh, the brief introduction that I just gave. I'm going to introduce the main tool that I'm going to use um, to understand uh, th these results, 
which is that of generalized probabilistic theories. I will briefly define and introduce the notion of non classicality, which I am interested in, which is generalized contextuality. I will define incompatibility of measurements. And then I'll argue that you can have uh, contextuality without incompatibility. And then I'll touch on some other stuff if, uh, if there's time. I should say, I, I don't really know the background of everyone in the audience. So I've tried to make this accessible and at least um, introduce all of the relevant mathematical uh, details that are needed to understand this. But if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt as the talk goes on. OK, so let's start by introducing the framework of generalized probabilistic theories. So this is a framework that's designed to subsume uh, both quantum and classical theory as special cases, but also allow us to reason about other sort of hypothetical theories of nature, but also um, sub-theories of quantum and classical theory as well, which uh, are possibly more relevant for this talk, in fact. Um, now I'm going to introduce not the entire framework of generalized probabilistic theories or GPTs, um, but just um, to start with at least the bit that's relevant for us, which is about the states and the measurements uh, in a theory. So for that purpose, I'm going to say the GPTs is defined as this triple. We've got the state space omega, the space of effects or measurement outcomes epsilon, and then we've got a probability rule that gives us for every state and effect pair, it gives us um, a probability in the unit interval. And okay, there's a bunch of convex geometry that goes with uh, the, the states and the effects. So let me try and give an overview of what this looks like. And then I'll illustrate this with examples of quantum and classical systems. So generically, the uh, state space is defined by well, you take some convex cone of states living in some real vector space, and then we define a hyperplane which uh, characterizes the normalization of the states. So then if we take the intersection of the hyperplane with the cone, this gives us this circle here, and that is the, the normalized set of states, uh, or causal states, they're sometimes known as well. And then anything sort of lying between that hyperplane and the origin then are subnormalized, and anything above are supernormalized. But really, it's this set um, of normalized states that are of primary interest to us. Uh, over on the effect side, things look a little bit more complicated. We've again got some sort of convex cone living in some real vector space. And then we've got a unique uh, discarding effect. This lets us sort of throw away or ignore systems. And that lives at sort of the top of this polytope that we can see here. And then we've got uh, subnormalized or subcausal effects that lie sort of in between the origin and this uh, discarding effect. And that's some convex set. And for, for reasons that will become apparent later on in this talk, I'm not going to give too many details about the precise nature of this geometry um, because it'll turn out not to be actually relevant. OK, so that's sort of an overview of the state geometry and the effect geometry. And then um, we have the probability rule that uh, is a bilinear mapping from these two vector spaces to the unit interval. OK, so what does this look like in the case of quantum theory? Well, the states are given by density matrices, the effects by POVM elements, and the probability rule is just the Born rule. So geometrically, we have the real vector space that the states live in, given by the space of self-adjoint emission operators. Um, and then we have the cone, is the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. And then the hyperplane is given by this uh, trace of rho equals one condition. So if trace of rho equals one, then we lie on this hyperplane, and uh, that defines the normalized states, and then subnormalized states would have a trace of rho uh, less than one. Okay, so that's the states. Over on the effect side, we have again the same real vector space of self adjoint operators. And now uh, the effects lie between zero and the unit effect. And so you can see uh, then that the probability rule is just given by the, the trace in a product. So in this case, we have that the states and the effects, they actually live in the same vector space. So uh, we can compute the probabilities using inner product. 
In other formalisms for GPTs, uh, the effects live in the dual space, and so uh, the probabilities are computed just by evaluating the effect on the state. But the two formalisms are equivalent. And now that we've defined the probability rule, you can see that really the normalization is being defined by this unique uh, discarding effect. Uh, the normalization says that if you give probability one on this uh, discarding effect, the identity, then it's a normalized state. And that's a generic feature for the GPTs that we're going to be considering today. Okay, so that's quantum theory as a GPT, and then we go to classical theory. Um, so in classical theory, the states are probability distributions over some set. Uh, the effects are given by response functions, and I don't know the name for the probability rule, um, so I've left that blank. If anyone knows what this rule is called, please let me know. <laughs> um, geometrically, though, um, we uh, I use D of lambda to denote the space of probability distributions over lambda. So these live in the real vector space of functions from lambda to the reals, uh, such that P of lambda is uh, non-negative for all lambda, and such that when we sum over the values of lambda, uh, of P of lambda, we get one. So this is the normalization condition. Um, I should say that I will, for this talk, be assuming that lambda is always finite. So all of our vector spaces are going to be finite dimensional. The response functions then tell us the probability of getting some uh, classical outcome, some measurement. So this basically says, okay, if you have a particular value, uh, if, if your classical system is in state little lambda, then what's the probability that this outcome occurs? So again, the effect, they live in the, uh, the vector space of functions from lambda to the reals, and in particular, they have to satisfy this normalization condition uh, for all lambda. And to figure out what the probability of getting a particular response uh, for some measurement, given some uh, probability distribution over lambda, we just average over uh, the possible values of lambda. Okay, so that's um, sort of a generic GPT, quantum GPT, and classical GPT that I've introduced. Now I want to introduce a notion of um, classical explainability for GPTs. So I, I don't want to just talk about uh, when a GPT is sort of strictly classical in this sense here, but also when it makes sense to say that some other GPT can be underpinned by some classical theory. And this is a notion that we call simplex embeddability um, because the, the cone of states and effects that we get in classical theory is a simplicial based cone. Um, so that's where the name comes from. And this is going to be the notion of non-classicality that uh, I'm going to introduce now. So we say that a classical explanation for some GPT is given by a set of states, classical states lambda, and then a pair of linear maps, iota and kappa such that iota maps the states omega of the GPT into the space of probability distributions over lambda. Um, so here in this example, you can think of this green space, this green uh, square as being the set of states for the GPT, and that's being embedded inside the space of uh, probability distributions. In this case, over four possible states. So lambda will be a four element set corresponding to the vertices of this tetrahedron. The uh, effects epsilon in the GPT get mapped to response functions. Um, so here we're just looking at some slice through the space because this would be a, a four-dimensional space. So this is just some slice and the blue space here is supposed to be uh, the space of effects for the GPT and the um, black outline is then the space of uh, the slice through the space of classical response functions. Um, and the full space of response functions defines a, a hypercube. Um, but it's not enough just to sort of say how our states and effects look like classically, but this classical model that we're trying to define has to reproduce the same probabilistic predictions as the GPT itself. 
So we say that for all states S in omega and effects E in epsilon, uh, that this rule has to be satisfied, that when we map the state to the classical model and the effect to the classical model using iota and kappa respectively, that then the probabilities that we compute for the classical model are the same as we get from the GPT. Otherwise, this doesn't actually explain what we will observe when we go and do some experiment in the lab. Okay, so this is a notion of classicality or non-classicality that you can express uh, within the language of GPTs. But I said at the start of the talk that this, this talk is going to be about contextuality. Um, and I haven't mentioned context at all yet. So how do, how do these two things relate to one another? So I won't go into the details here um, because they're not relevant to any of the results that I want to present. Um, but to give a high level overview, the idea is that, okay, I've talked about GPTs and simplex embeddings so far. And if you've ever seen any work on generalized non-contextuality, you'll have seen things about operational theories or operational scenarios and non-contextual ontological models. And these non-contextual ontological models are really maps from the operational scenario to classical probability theory. Um, essentially, preparation procedures that you can do in the lab get mapped to probability distributions and operational uh, measurement outcomes get mapped to response functions. And then we define a notion of context for this operational scenario, and then the ontological model is non-contextual if uh, the mapping doesn't depend on the context defined in the operational scenario. Okay, so how do these two a priori distinct notions relate to one another? Well, it turns out that you can think of a generalized probabilistic theory as really just being an operational scenario where we quotient out the context information. So we just discard the context information and that gives us our GPT. And then the existence of a non-contextual ontological model for the operational scenario is uh, equivalent to the existence of a simplex embedding for the GPT that we get when we quotient the operational scenario. So a non-contextual ontological model exists uh, if and only if a simplex embedding exists and uh, then the non-contextual ontological model factors through the quotienting map. So that means that rather than studying non-contextual ontological models of operational scenarios, we can equivalently just study simplex embeddings of GPTs. And for me, at least, this is a much simpler mathematical object uh, to study. So that's going to be the focus of this talk. OK, so then we have uh, the sort of key theorem that underpins basically everything else that I'm going to say today. And which is that when it comes to simplex embeddings, it's really only the conic geometry that matters. So I said earlier that I wasn't going to go into too much, too many details about um, exactly how to define the sort of the convex geometry of the GPT. And this is why, uh, because it turns out not to actually be important, at least for deciding on simplex embeddability. In other words, OK, if we want to decide whether this GPT is simplex embeddable, all we actually need to specify is what the cone uh, of states is, what the cone of effects is, and what the probability rule is. Any sort of further details about normalization or the precise geometry of the effect space uh, between the discarding effect and the zero effect, none of that matters. All that matters is, are the convex cones. And I, I'm not going to prove this theorem. Um, you can look at the, the paper if you want to see the details of this. Uh, the proof itself, I don't think, is particularly enlightening, just the result. So an immediate corollary of this theorem is that if we have two different GPTs, uh, but they define the same cones, so the cone of omega is equal to the cone of omega prime, and the cone of epsilon is equal to the cone of epsilon prime, uh, then either both of these GPTs are simplex embeddable, so not uh, so classical, or neither of them are. So they're, they're either both classical or both non-classical. 
Uh, so this is just a picture trying to just illustrate what we mean by two state spaces. So uh, having the same cone. So on the left, A here, we have omega, say, and on the right, B is omega prime. But we can see that if we then look at the cone that they define, that it's the same. And it's defined by these uh, red arrows here. And a similar condition for the effects. So to give an example of where two GPTs which share the same codes come up, if we have one GPT that describes some experiments, and then we have another GPT that describes the same experiment, but where we have detector inefficiency, then we find that these two uh, have the same codes. So the states don't change at all. So omega prime is just equal to omega, but all of the effects in the inefficient uh, scenario are just scaled down by some probability p. But obviously, if I look at the, as long as p doesn't equal zero, then the cone of e prime is equal to the cone of e. So what this means is that if we have a scenario that has contextuality um, with perfect detectors, that we can make those detectors arbitrarily inefficient as long as um, they're not sort of zero efficiency, but arbitrarily close to zero efficiency, and we still find that that scenario is contextual. Okay, so that's my brief introduction to incompatibility, uh, to non-contextuality, sorry, uh, but cast in this geometric language as simplex embeddability. So the other part of the title of the talk was incompatibility, so I should introduce that, although I think it's a, a more commonly studied thing than contextuality, so hopefully this needs less of an introduction. But incompatibility is really uh, about a set of measurements. Um, so here we have a set of measurements, m of b given y, where b represents the measurement outcome, and y is sort of the setting, that is the choice of measurements. And we say this set of measurements is incompatible if and only if there's no parent measurement, uh, this calligraphic m with outcome z, and a conditional probability distribution, P of uh, uh, B given Z and Y, such that we can obtain any of these measurements um, by first doing the measurement uh, using the parent measurement and then doing some sort of post-processing of the outcome. I think this definition is, for me, more nicely illustrated by a diagram. So we can describe this set of measurements by this uh, process here, M, where S is the GPT of interest, Y here is our classical choice of measurement, and B is the outcome of the measurement. So this is really a set of measurements, and we say that this set of measurements is uh, compatible if we can find this parent measurement calligraphic M, which is just a single measurement with a single outcome Z, uh, such that there's a post-processing which lets us simulate any of the other uh, measurements that we want to do. So this post-processing depends on the classical variable Y and then spits out this uh, outcome B. Okay, so that's the standard definition. And all that actually matters for this talk is a very trivial observation about this definition. And that is that in order to have measurement incompatibility, we have to have more than one measurement, right? If we just have one measurement, then uh, this Y uh, is just the trivial system. There's, there's no setting choice. And so the parent measurement is just M itself and the post-processing is just the identity. Okay. So that's incompatibility in one slide. And now we're going to work towards showing how to get uh, contextuality without any incompatibility. And we're going to do this a couple of different ways, but the first way uses this trick that we call flag convexification. 
And this is an operational method to convert a set of measurements into a single measurement. Um, that's the maths, but I think uh, it's a very intuitive idea that is sort of obfuscated by this bunch of symbols. The basic idea is that if we have some set of measurements, we can turn it into a single measurement by flipping a coin and deciding which measurement to perform. And then keeping track of the outcome of the coin flip or the dice roll if we've got more than two measurements. Um, keeping track of that as an extra measurement outcome. So here, this new of y is supposed to be the probability distribution over the choices of measurements. And then we get this, uh, the new measurement, uh, which now has two outcomes, little b and little y. So we turn sort of a choice of setting into an extra outcome for the measurements. Importantly, though, we want this probability distribution to be full support. So we want all settings to be used, um, at least some of the time. Diagrammatically, we can draw that like this. Uh, this M was our measurement with Y, the choice of settings. And then we have this sort of dice roll or coin flip new, uh, which gives us the choice of setting. And then we copy that and use the measurements conditioned on that, but we also keep a copy of which uh, outcome occurred and feed up forward to be a new uh, outcome of this measurement. Okay, um, but if we look at uh, just the cones that we get now from this these two different measurements or these two different measurement scenarios, on the one hand, we can look at all of the effects that we get by uh, our original scenario where we chose the measurement and looked at the different outcomes. That would be a uh, cone of M of B given Y. But we can also look at the cone that we get uh, in this uh, flight convexified situation where we just have now, we don't have any choice of measurement. We, we choose the, um, the setting based on this dice roll. But clearly, as long as we choose this probability distribution new of y to be full support, then the two cones are going to be the same. So when we do this flag convexification trick, we uh, don't change the cone of effects. That's the key thing that I want you to take away from this. OK, and with that in place, then I can run you through the arguments uh, about how we can have contextuality without incompatibility. So the basic idea is suppose we have some GPT, which is not simplex embeddable. And uh, the, the effects here come from some set of measurements, let's say. Then we can define the flag convexified scenario. So we can take the measurements that define the effect space and we can flag convexify it. So now we just have a single measurement in our theory. But we know by my previous argument that this defines the same codes. So these two GPTs that we now have for the original scenario and for the flag convexified scenario, they're going to be, uh, well, they've got exactly the same states and then the effects are going to be uh, defining the same codes. So the flag convexified scenario is also not simplex embeddable because the original wasn't. The original one wasn't. But this new scenario has just a single measurement. And so by that trivial observation that I made before, it clearly doesn't have any incompatibility. So now this flag convexified scenario uh, features contextuality, but it doesn't have any incompatibility. I think sort of a common response that we, we've got when we talk to people about this work, though, um, is really that people feel like we're pulling some sort of trick here. After all, we start with something that does have incompatibility, and then we do this flag convexification to turn it into something that doesn't. But it does feel a bit like we've just sort of, you know, hidden the incompatibility somewhere. We've sort of, it's still there somehow, but we've just uh, obfuscated it. And 
I don't necessarily think this is a legitimate criticism, um, but it's nice to see that we can also have examples where we don't need to use this trick. Um, so we came up with this example um, for qubit, and it's given by uh, sort of this, a set of uh, five states equally positioned around sort of the real plane of the qubit. And uh, we sort of take uh, the measurement, just a single measurement that has uh, five POVM, element, POVM elements, and these are just shrunk down so that they sum to the unit. So they're the same as the effects, just shrunk down by some normalization factor. And you can show that this uh, does not admit of a simplex embedding. So this example features contextuality. And also you can prove that this can't be viewed as the flag convexification of some set of projective measurements. I won't go into the details of this, um, but roughly it follows a counting kind of argument. The sort of set of uh, outcomes for some flag convexified uh, measurement has to be the product of the number of settings and the number of outcomes for your original set. And so this is five, so this is prime. So this uh, you, you can't see this as a flag convexification or something. OK, um, so, so far I've just sort of claimed that this example can't be simplex embedded. Um, we do in the paper have a sort of analytic proof of this, uh, but I wanted to sort of use this opportunity to sort of advertise another paper to you, um, which is uh, a way to generally test for simplex embeddability, and that's via a linear program. So if you look in this paper here, um, we provide, well, we, we prove that this linear program works, and then we provide uh, a Mathematica and a Python implementation of it. So basically, this is a program or it's code where you can feed it a set of quantum states and a set of quantum effects or PVM elements, and it will tell you whether this is simplex embeddable or not. So it'll tell you whether that um, an experiment that realizes those states and effects uh, whether that's contextual or non-contextual. And it does some other stuff at like computer robustnesses and this kind of thing, but um, that's not relevant for us here. So the idea is that we can feed it in this linear program the set of states in this pentagon and the set of effects, this sort of subnormalized pentagon, and then it tells us um, that this is a contextual uh, scenario. Um, so this is the linear program here. I won't explain all of the things going on here, but we've got omega, which is the set of states again, epsilon, which is the set of effects, and then we need to uh, argue that this is classically explainable if and only if the following linear program is satisfied. So we need to find some real matrix sigma where all of the elements of the matrix are uh, non-negative, uh, such that this condition 9b holds. Um, these two h's are computed from sort of the facet inequalities that define the two cones. Uh, so these uh, sort of manifestly only depend on the conic structure and not the full geometry. And then the left hand side, these i's here, uh, they're basically this probability rule um, that I introduced before, just a uh, a different notation for it. It's a slightly different formalism that we use in this paper. Um, so the, this, this looks a bit different, but it's really just the probability rule in disguise. OK, so you can go to this linear program, you can feed these things in, and then it tells you that this, uh, this scenario is contextual. OK, but maybe you're still not entirely convinced, um, despite this argument. And I think it 
the reason why I've put this up is because when I came to preparing this uh, talk, I found myself to not be entirely convinced what I'd said myself. And this was because I'd have to say that this can't be viewed as a flag convexification of a set of projective measurements. But maybe it could be viewed as a flag convexification of a set of um, POVMs. And maybe that set of POVMs would feature incompatibility. And so uh, then maybe you could try and argue that that means there is actually some hidden incompatibility. Um, I know that I discussed this uh, with my co-authors when we wrote the paper, and I was persuaded that really incompatibility of PVMs was the relevant thing, but still I kind of, when I prepared the talk, I couldn't really convince myself of that fact. So I decided to try and take another approach to um, this question. Um, so let me try and refine this sort of, uh, this argument. Like how can we really convince ourselves that we don't need incompatibility anywhere in order to get contextuality? So you might say, okay, the particular scenarios that we have shown, like this Pentagon one or the flat convexified ones, they don't have incompatibility, but the full theory in which they live, quantum theory does. So maybe even if the particular scenario doesn't have incompatibility, maybe we still need to have incompatibility in the theory as a whole. So this is what I started thinking about. And I should say that the following is work in progress. So I believe it's true, but I haven't uh, had a chance yet to write up all the details of the proof. So um, it could turn out to be wrong. Um, but let me talk you through my attempt at proof that you can have entire theories without incompatibility, uh, but which do have contextuality. And here I should also warn you that now I'm sort of shifting terminology a bit. So far I've been talking about generalized probabilistic theories as just being this sort of pair of states, with the state space and the effect space. Now, when I talk about a full theory, what I mean is not just the states and effects for a system, but also sort of the compositional structure. So also some sort of tensor product rule that says how uh, composite systems are constructed out of si uh, simpler systems, and also to define things like transformations and sequences of transformations and so on. So the, the, full, uh, the full structure of a physical theory, not just the states and effects for a particular system. Can uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, probably I'm sure I missed a lot uh, of uh, previous uh, uh, your talk, uh, but you you are you are you saying actually you can uh, get con contextuality without uh, uh, incompatibility. Yeah, that means every. Uh, Operators commute each other, and you cannot, you can uh, derive, you can actually get the quantum effect uh, without uh, compatibility. Uh, so, so here I'm defining incompatibility. Uh, let me flick back a little bit. Uh, here we go. So, so this is how I define incompatibility. So this is about, uh, in the language of quantum theory at least, this is about uh, POVM measurements rather than projective measurements. So um, here, the, the scenario that features uh, compa uh, contextuality without incompatibility uh, is for non-projective measurements. I believe that if we limited ourselves to considering only projective measurements, then it should be the case that if we have a compatible set of projective measurements, that we cannot have contextuality. Uh, so it's, it's when we go to the non-projective uh, case that we uh, see this phenomenon. It depending on the, how we measure, how we actually type of measurement we choose. I mean, when you say compatibility and 
contextuality is uh, should not depending on what kind of measurement we we choose. Uh, I'm not sure I, I follow the question. So, uh, so, so, it, so it depends on wh whether you consider projective measurements or uh, right. measurements. Yeah. So uh, I, ha I hadn't thought about this. Um, so, but I, I, yeah, I believe that non-projectiveness of the measurement is essential uh, for having uh, contextuality without incompatibility. Okay. And in, intuitively, the reason for this is because uh, you need to have some notion of context around. And um, if we have a set of projective measurements which are compatible, then I think there's no uh, meaningful uh, contexts to, right. to define contextuality. But um, maybe maybe it's um, useful to show in this pentagon example. Um, so in this pentagon example, we see that the different effects in this single measurement, they themselves have a context. So we could imagine, okay, let, let me point on, on the, the state space just because it's a bit easier. But suppose we take some mixture of this state here or this effect here with this effect here then that gives us one decomposition of some other effect. But also we can decompose that same effect in terms of some convex combination of two other effects. So this sort of non-uniqueness of decomposition of effects into extremal effects defines a notion of context, even with just a single measurement. And it's that kind of context that we're leveraging in order to get uh, contextuality in this scenario. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Thanks for giving me the chance to clarify. I think that's useful. Okay, so I was trying to argue that, um, okay, we need to go to now define sort of a full compositional theory with states, effects, transformations, composite systems, and so on, uh, in order to try and convince you that we really can have sort of a fully fledged physical theory that doesn't have uh, incompatibility, but that does have contextuality. And as I said, this is a work in progress, but essentially what we can do is we can start with some GPT described or just the sort of state effects and probability rule for some system in some GPT. Um, and from this, we can sort of construct out of it sort of a minimal compositional theory, uh, which I call G of this uh, triple, uh, which contains it. So we sort of freely generate a bunch of structure. We freely generate transformations. Uh, we freely generate uh, composite systems and so on. OK, so we, we define this minimal compositional theory that then sort of by construction has composition, transformations, and so on. And then what I claim um, is that incompatibility of this, uh, this uh, GPT, describe, or the, the state's effects and probability rule for the GPT, um, exists if and only if there's incompatibility in this minimal compositional theory that we construct. In other words, when we take sort of this closure, when we freely generate this extra structure, um, this isn't something that can create incompatible measurements. And then if you look at contextuality, well, we find that contextuality of this triple is going to imply contextuality of this minimal compositional theory that we construct. Interestingly, um, I don't think the implication goes the other way. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this argument, luckily I just need the, the sort of left to right implication here. So then if we start with some GPT, which is contextuality and has no incompatibility, then by these results that I think I've proven, uh, then this minimal compositional theory will also be contextual and also have no incompatibility. So 
now if you come to me and say, okay, how do we know you have just hidden the incompatibility somewhere? Well, the answer is sort of, there's nowhere for it to be hidden. This is a full theory that doesn't have incompatibility. Okay, um, so I, I'm not gonna go into the details of all of this, because um, as I said, it's still a work in progress. Uh, but what I want to flag up is this other paper that we uh, put out somewhat recently, well, not that recently anymore, a few years ago now, um, which is where we uh, define the notion of contextuality for these general sort of compositional theories rather than just for uh, states and effects of a system. And I encourage you to have a look at the paper to, to see how this works. I just wanted to put up the definition um, so you could see get a flavor of what kind of things are going on. So in order to do this, we use sort of the language of category theory uh, at the end of the day, or, and we view the, uh, the generalized probabilistic theory as a symmetric model category, and then we define ontological models as functors basically between these categories, uh, satisfying a bunch of properties. Um, and you can use a nice diagrammatic representation of all of these things uh, if you don't like the language of category theory. And uh, essentially what happens is you have some transformations and they get replaced by stochastic maps in a consistent way. And so it's within this framework that I hope to uh, prove these, or I believe I have proven these results that I mentioned in this work in progress. Okay, um, how much, am I running out of time or should I keep talking about stuff? I think I'm running out of time. Uh, you have uh, still uh, 10 minutes. Oh, okay, uh, then I think I can run through the last bits of what I want to say. Okay, so um, yeah, hopefully those results that I'm working on at the moment will come out at some point. And, uh, Hopefully I don't find any mistakes in the proofs. Anyway, um, so far this, I, I talked about the sort of flag convexification trick on the measurement side of things. So where I take a set of measurements and I turn them into a single measurement. Well, we can also do something similar for states as well. We can take some set of states or more generally some set of sources. So a source is just um, a state preparation procedure where we sort of get some classical flag which tells us which uh, of some set of states has been prepared. And we can convert that into a single source, again, by taking the, the setting variable, picking it with some random variable, mu of x. And as long as that has full support, then this defines a new uh, procedure, um, a new source uh, with no settings at all. Diagrammatically, that looks like this. So we have this preparation procedure, which had some outcome and some setting uh, variable. And we just choose the setting according to some probability distribution mu and keep a track of which setting was chosen as a new outcome. And again, as long as this probability distribution has full support, then we end up with the same uh, cone of states at the end of the day. Okay, so now I've shown you that we can, on the measurement side, we can turn a sort of setting, a choice of settings into an outcome. And now I've shown that we can also uh, do the same on the side of the states as well. So we can do both of those at once, right? We can uh, turn our scenario that has measurement settings into one that doesn't have measurement settings and one that has, uh, sorry, that's this side. Uh, we can change a measurement setting into a measurement outcome, and we can change a state or source setting into an outcome for the source as well. And this preserves the cones. So the cone of states is preserved and the cone of effects is preserved. So if we start with some scenario that has contextuality, and then we flag convexify both the state side and the measurement side, then we're left with a scenario that doesn't have any settings at all, but it still has contextuality. 
So this is sort of contextuality purely from observational data, if you want. Like there's no there's no choice of settings to make at all in this experiment. So this means that we can have contextuality without any sort of freedom of choice assumption that we uh, need in the case of sort of uh, Bell and classicality. Okay, so that was the, the last little bit that I wanted to talk about. So let me summarize what I've uh, talked about today. So I briefly introduced this new geometric perspective on contextuality uh, in terms of simplex embeddability uh, and generalized probabilistic theories. I argued uh, that only the conic geometry of the generalized probabilistic theory actually matters, the, sort of the details of normalization and the detailed geometry of the effects and the state spaces, they're, they're irrelevant. And so immediately this told us that we could have contextuality with arbitrarily inefficient uh, detectors on the measurements. And then I introduced this flag convexification trick where we turn settings into outcomes. And if we do that on the measurement side, then we see that we can have contextuality without any incompatibility. And if we do that on both the measurement and the state side of things, we can uh, furthermore get contextuality without any settings at all, and so without any freedom of choice. I mentioned that we now have this linear program um, and uh, open source implementations of it for testing for simplex embeddability. So I encourage you to go and have a play with this tool. Um, the idea is that it's supposed to be very accessible and easy to use. I don't know whether we've really succeeded at that yet, but uh, that's the, the hope. So if you've got feedback on that tool, please let me know. Um, but it should be really simple just to feed it quantum states and effects and find out whether your scenario is contextual or not. And then I very briefly talked about uh, how we can define contextuality for uh, theories when we go beyond just sort of prepare and measure or, or beyond the sort of states and effects uh, perspective on GPTs to define competent systems and transformations and so on. And um, in this work in progress, I've tried to show that we can have uh, a fully fledged compositional theory of physics, which is contextual and which doesn't feature any incompatibility. Okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you've got. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Now we can uh, open uh, the seminar for questions. Hi, I, I have several questions. Um, possibly partly because I don't understand very well. I'm a bit stupid, but um, hopefully at least some of them are, are not completely stupid. Um, so sure let me think for a second. Um, so it, it's well known, I think, in quantum theory that um, if you take a bunch of measurements, whatever they are, uh, PRVMs, and you mix them with enough noise, like just enough, enough random noise, you add more detector inefficiency, I think, in language, eventually they become compatible. Um, this, this just always happens. Um, so is this also the case in GPTs? Or, because this would like, I think this would streamline things a bit, right? Um, uh, so there's an important distinction to make between detector inefficiency and sort of uh, noisy detectors. Okay. Um, so here I was talking about inefficient detectors. Um, where you can think of it a bit like mixing in the sort of zero effect. So mm -hmm. I have some effect and then I go to some scaled down version of it. So just multiply it by some probability P. Okay. And in that case, I don't believe that even in quantum theory, this kills off uh, compat incompatibility. Oh, compatibility. Which way do I mean? Incompatibility, yeah. Whereas if I sort of add in noise in the sense of sort of mixing with uh, the unit effect, then this takes my cone and it sort of shrinks it in. Mm -hmm. And then this is no longer sort of defining the same effect cone. And so the, the argument falls apart. So, so then if I add in sort of noise, like mixing with the, the unit or the identity in, in, in quantum theory, then this kills off uh, contextuality. Uh, necessarily, and I think that's what kills off incompatibility as well. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this. On so my, okay, I, I don't have a formal like My intuition with the first thing uh, with with mixing with the zero effect is that um, 
okay, if I if I mix my effects with the zero effect, what happens is essentially sometimes they kind of morally speak they don't give an outcome, kind of morally speaking. Yeah. And I can think of what happens if effect. Well, okay, maybe. Okay, no, uh, I have to think about it more before I can say anything. Actually, yeah, what, what I was thinking doesn't make sense. Sorry. <laughs> No, I mean, I, on, the, well, on the contextuality side, I'm confident that, uh, that what I'm yeah. saying is correct. On the incompatibility side, um, I really don't know for sure whether this sort of inefficient detectors killed incompatibility or not. Um, my intuition is no, but yeah, I, I would need to check. Mm -hmm. My intuition is like, if I have an, my intuition is that I have an array of perfect detectors and um, an inefficient detector and sort of the inefficient detector what happens is um, sort of the inefficiency in detector A is in fact the particle going to detector B instead. But I don't know if this actually like works properly. Like I, I model, I get some like some loss in detector A, which is sort of what happens. With, but I don't know if this actually works out. So yeah, the way I was thinking about it is is that sort of there's an extra outcome of your measurement. So you think you're, or this, oh, this is how we model it in the paper at least. We we say. Okay, you've got some measurement that you think has three outcomes, but actually sometimes nothing happens. The detector doesn't fire. So let's model that sort of not firing as uh, just an extra outcome, like this, mm -hmm. a, a not firing outcome. That's, uh, because you know that you sent a state in, so you know that something should have happened and it just didn't. So yeah. this is information we can use. So we can say, okay, not firing, we're just gonna view that as an extra outcome of the measurement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that's how we formalize things here. Uh, but I, th I think there's different ways of doing that. OK, thanks. I have another question. Hey, thank you. Maybe uh, someone else. Uh, one by one. Uh, Continue. Yeah, uh, I, maybe I, I we can leave something a... for, for our videos now. Yes. Uh, all right. Hey. Uh, so I, uh, as you may, as you correctly predicted, I am not convinced. <laughs> I am, uh, it's not to say that I don't believe that you did it correctly. It's just like my feeling, mm -hmm. uh, but from a different perspective that you talked about. So my feeling is that you did some kind of sleight of hand with contextuality definition. You, you in introduced the geometric, uh, geometric kind of description that you okay you can do this uh, flag conic or whatever it was called mm -hmm. and then you can okay you can apply the you can apply this in a standard scenario then you can like you changed a bit or you you did this uh, that you have one measurement in pro probabilistically you you choose the sub measurement mm -hmm. yeah and my feeling is that the the, the kind of geometric extension that the, it wouldn't hold in a, necessarily in in that one measurement scenario. This is kind of w w the, the feeling that I get. So maybe I don't know. Can you convince me that it's not? Or I don't know if I ex explain my feelings clearly. I, I'm not sure I necessarily understand the the, the details of what you're saying, but. Um... What, what about this example, the, the Pentagon example here? Um, here, we're, we're not starting with one scenario and turning it into another scenario. Here, we just have a single POVM um, defined in terms of the sort of uh, subnormalized projectors. Um, this is a valid POVM measurement in quantum theory. And it's just a single measurement. Uh, and this is the geometry of the effects that we get for that single measurement. And this geometry is, and the, we have these states. Uh, and these geometries are just, you can you can prove that these are not simplex embeddable. Uh, and hence, that we necessarily have contextuality in this mm. uh, scenario. So here, I'm not having to do what, any tricks by sort of swapping something which has incompatibility and turning it into something that doesn't have incompatibility. This is just from the beginning, from the very beginning, a single measurement uh, scenario. So, so does this uh, still... But are, are you starting from like the... Because, okay, I, I have not worked extensively on contextuality, so I am not clear on how the, the geometric approach 
relates to kind of the standard definition but is it like i don't know what are the what are the is it comp always applicable because this is what what kind of drives me that i look at this and i'm not kind of because you obviously you couldn't go into details but uh is it also so hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think okay, I, okay, I, okay, I, think no, I understand. No. It's sort of about the um, applicability of this geometric method. Yeah, precisely. As a whole. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, so um, I introduced the geometric method uh, here in terms of just the states and effects um, for some system, but in fact, it holds uh, totally generically. Um, so this, this paper that I mentioned here, where we define everything in terms of compositional theories. Uh, this is really just a, a generalization of the simplex embeddability condition. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how generally does simplex embeddability hold? Well, extremely, basically. Um, or it, it generalizes uh, extremely generally. Uh, okay. And the sort of proof that this is, uh, I, I showed this triangle um, the sort of non contextual ontological models factorized through the simplex embedding um, that holds again in this general compositional case. So, for general compositional theories, we can define a notion of uh, non contextual ontological models for operational theories, and those exist if and only if they uh, sort of factorize through the quotiented uh, theory, which we get by stripping out contexts. Uh, and the, those theories are exactly uh, generalized probabilistic theories in this compositional sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all, all of that lifts uh, to this uh, general scenario. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Yeah, I had a question, in fact, exactly about that triangle that you just mentioned, this diagram about... Um, yeah, let, let me put that back up. Yeah. So if I understood correctly, the the line of the argument was, okay, I have an operational scenario, I, I delete the context, I forget about the context, I get a GPT, and this thing is simplex embeddable if and only if the original guy had a non-contextual ontological model. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Um, so sort of one direction is, is obvious, right? Like if we have yeah. a simplex embedding, then we can sort of yeah, yeah. take the operational theory quotient, simplex embed that defines a non-contextual ontological model. The tricky bit is the the other direction. Um, yes, but essentially, you how does it work? Because this is non-contextual, then um, we can sort of pick a representative element here. No, so we start with a GPT. We pick some representative element um, for the equivalent classes, the quotient to that particular GPT thing, state effect transformation, and then we know that we can map that to classical probability theory and that defines the simplex embedding and this is a consistent choice a thing to do because uh, the choice of representative element is irrelevant because of non-contextuality of this arrow here. Ah, uh, okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, cool. I think that, yeah, that was essentially my question, yeah. Thank you. Cool. I, I had one okay. more question, but I shouldn't <laughs> ask all the questions. Yes. Uh, so right at the end, well, in your in your last section, you were talking about um, moving to these kind of generalized theories where you have composition and um, also some kind of dynamics you mentioned along the way. Mm -hmm. I was kind of interested that you bring these two in together. Like it's sort of natural to me that you can add dynamics to a GPT and natural that you can add composition. But it was kind of yeah. strange to me that these two came like together as a package when you were talking. Can you um, comment on why you need them? But do you need them both? Or no, you can't. You, you definitely can define one without the other. Uh, I guess probably independent of one another. I think you can. Well, you can definitely define transformations for GPT without needing composite systems, and you can definitely define composite systems without needing to define dynamics. So yeah, um, but. In, yeah, I guess I just wanted to do the full full generalization in, in both directions, and yes. to some extent they kind of go together um, because often you need to know what your composite systems look like to know which dynamics are valid dynamics. Think about sort of the complete positivity condition in quantum theory. 
you need to know what your entangled states look like to know which dynamics are allowed. Um, so it's quite natural to introduce them both at the same time, but logically speaking, it's not strictly necessary to do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, if we don't have any other questions. I have uh, one small question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, going to be the last one. So you said uh, that for your model that uh, this uh, POVM, they are particularly important, right? Yeah. Okay, so is there any other uh, constant on the POVM elements like rank or other thing? I've not looked at that at all. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, okay. Yeah, I know they need to be POVMs, not projective, but beyond that, I I know nothing about the structure. Now, if you, if you consider extended Hilbert space, like, uh, I mean, uh, implementing these POVMs, then uh, you can think about uh, projective uh, measurement, right? Yeah. So what will happen in that case? If you consider extended Hilbert space, uh, good question. Um, I think so. First of all, is it allowed at all for your model to think about extended Hilbert space? Uh, no, it, it is. Um, but you probably have to go beyond the sort of. You probably have to go to this compositional uh, framework that I was talking about. Like we, we need to now say, okay, we've got some composite system, we've got some measurement on the composite system. Um, and so we now need to define uh, ontological models that um, deal with composition and, and so on. And I've not run through the details of this, but my guess is that we still end up with a proof of contextuality at the end of the day using these sort of uh, extended uh, protective measurements. But yeah, I, I haven't checked the details of that, so I, I, I'm not certain. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, then we can finish the seminar for today. John, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It was a very interesting talk, very controversial topic. It's, it's good to have something like that from time to time. I uh, would like to thank all the audience today and see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.